nice introduction. Thank you. Um, I think this is my sixth time back to Oregon. <laughs> and, uh, it's great to be back here. Thank you. It does feel very friendly here. Been on the road, I think, about 150, 200 days in the past two years. Not always in such friendly events. So it's uh, what Marshall, uh, what Marsha asked me to do was sort of look at what has happened in the last two years after I wrote the book, and maybe what we can see what's happening in terms of changes, and also maybe what we can learn from what's happened in the past two years. And I told her at dinner tonight, I didn't really prepare a talk, so this is going to be a little bit like jazz. We're just going to bring it just a bit. Um, so just some of you read the book, some of you had not, and the book really sets up an essential tension for society, an essential question for society. And I really think it's a profound moral question. So it goes like this. It's, a, it's around how do we as a society really respond to mental distress, psychiatric distress? Are we doing it well? Are, doing, are we doing it humanely? Is it working for us as a society? Is it working for individuals? Or not? And if not, what might we do differently? And what science may tell us about doing differently? And, um, I think you can see one of the things a society does that is so important and is so revealing about a society is how does it care for those in distress. It really is a measure of that society, so I think you can see what a profound question this is. And it's also a question you know that really is affecting childhood in this country. That's because more and more children are getting diagnosed and medicated, so we really want to know if that's working out well as well. So these are profound moral questions. Now, the, the conventional belief, which maybe we started with, is that we are doing a great job. And the conventional belief goes like this. In 1955, we get a drug called Thorazine into asylum medicine, and this launches a psychopharmacological revolution. This great leap forward in care of mentally ill. It enables us to empty the mental, in the mental hospitals. And then if you hear the words, we get antipsychotics. You hear that word? Antipsychotics, like antibiotics, in other words, that they're antidotes to psychosis. Then we get antidepressants, anti anxiety agents, all of these tell of drugs that are antidotes to specific diseases. And if that's true, that is generally a story of great medical progress when you have antidotes to a specific well defined illness. And then, as part of this, again, this story of progress, it goes like this. In 1987, we get Prozac that arrives on the market. This is an SSRI antidepressant, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And this is the first of the, what we call the second generation psychiatric drugs are better than the first ones. So the first generation of antidepressants were tricyclic antidepressants and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Now with Prozac's arrival, we get um, the SSRIs and they are said to be safer and more effective than those older drugs. Then we get new antipsychotics. We get new atypical antipsychotics like Risperdal, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Abilify, and they are said to be so much uh, safer and more effective than those old drugs like Thorazine and Haldol. So it's the story of medical progress. And as part of this arrival of the second generation drugs, we are told that they fix chemical imbalances in the brain. Okay? Again, that's a story of great progress. Because generally in medicine, when you see great leaps forward, you come to understand the biology of a disorder, and then you have a drug or a treatment that really fixes that pathology, okay? And that's what we, as a society, are told. They fix chemical imbalances. And by the way, recently there was a survey, and 80% of Americans now know that depression is caused by low serotonin, and the drugs fix that, okay? That's our belief system. And in 1998, uh, our U.S. Surgeon General, our top doctor in the country, wrote a 400-page report on mental health, and he said this, Prior to the arrival of Thorazine, we lacked treatments that would prevent people from becoming chronically ill. And now we have a vast array of safe and effective treatments for well-defined well uh, mental disorders. So officially, at the very top level of our medical establishment, we have the story of progress, okay? Drugs that prevent criticism. Now, what do I do in anatomy of an epidemic that sort of challenges that wisdom, that conventional belief? 
Well, the first thing I do is I just look at disability rates and how they've changed since 1955. And this is the number of people under government care due to mental illness. And how has that changed as the psychopharmacological revolution unfolded? Now, the reason this is a beginning metric for uh, sort of assessing whether this, we've had this great leap forward is this. Generally, when you get a uh, treatment, a medical treatment for you know, a problem, a disease, a disorder um, that is effective and a great leap forward, you will see the burden of that disease either at least stabilize it in a society or hopefully decline. Does that make sense? When you get an effective treatment. So I just wanted to look at how many people do we have on disability under government care and how did it change as the psychopharmacological revolution unfolded. Well, if you do this as a first metric, you find that in 1955, at the start of this revolution, there were 560,000 people in state and county mental hospitals. And at that time, people who, quote, were disabled by mental illness, that's where they were. There was no social security to take care of people in the community. But you dig into that number a bit, you find about 200,000 people in those hospitals were there with neurological disorders, in-stage Alzheimer's, in syphilis, other things. And there were 360,000 people with psychiatric disorders, okay? So the disability rate in 1955, at the start of this revolution, was about 1 in 480. So you take that number, you look at the total population, and that's how you calculate the disability rate. Now, what other researchers have said, researchers studying quote, the number of disabled mentally ill in our society, have said is, what you have to do to track this number going forward, because we de do deinstitutionalize, and you have to start looking at the number of people on SSI or SSDI. These are government programs for people who are disabled by some disorder or another. And look at people on those programs due to mental illness. Okay? That's what other researchers say the best metric going forward. You do that and you find in 1987, which by time deinstitutionalization is pretty complete, there were 1.25 million adults, 18 to 66, on SSI or SSDI in 1987. So during this era of the first generation psychiatric drugs, we went from 360,000 people to 1.25 million. And that's a disability rate of around 1 in 184. So you see a rise. Now the caveat with that is this. Maybe you had to be much sicker to be in the hospital in 1955 to be on disability in 1987. So maybe that's an apples to oranges comparison. But we have the same metric going forward from 1987. And it's during this period, 1987 forward, that we really embraced this drug model of care, the use of psychiatric drugs. So, for example, in 1987, we spent $800 million on psychiatric drugs in this country. In 2007, we spent $40 billion. So that's a 50-fold increase. And now, what happened to disability numbers during that 20 years? Well, it went from 1.25 million people to 4 million people. It tripled. Now, I wrote this book in 2007. I mean, I wrote the, the book was published in, what year is today? 2010. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the book was published in 2010, so uh, I was really tracking the numbers in 2007. Anyway, I think we're up to around 4.8 million now. So there's been another 800,000 since I really did the research for this book. And so we're now getting down to a disability rate of around 1 in 60. Okay, so you see that as the psychopharmacological revolution has unfolded, rather than the burden of mental distress sort of declining in our society, it has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, one other thing here. How about children? In 1987, there were 16,200 children on disability under age 18 due to mental illness. In other words, they got an SSI payment. Today, we're over 700,000. And it's during this time, of course, we've done a lot of diagnosing and a lot of use of medications. If you follow those kids, it's almost as if, and if you follow those kids forward until age 18, about two-thirds now go on to adult disability when they hit age 18. And so you sort of see opening up in our society this new pathway for some kids. They get diagnosed, they get medicated, they get on disability, and many of them have a life as a mental patient, so to speak, laid out uh, before them. So we're seeing distress among our children now this does not prove anything about the merits of the medications, but I think it does this. It 
begins to raise a question for us as a society. Right? Is this really working, this paradigm of care? Uh, because I think two things. Ideally, we don't want people to go on disability. And it's great to have disability out there as a safety net. But ideally, we're going to help people get back to work full lives, right? I mean, that's the goal. And also, just as a society, we just can't continue to afford these rising disability numbers. So you can see, we might have to do something different as a society. Okay? So that's one thing. So then, what I did want to do, once I got those disability numbers, is look at this question. A couple of questions related to the medications. Well, the first thing I wanted to look at, do they fix chemical imbalances in the brain? Is that story true? The second thing I wanted to look at is, how do they shape long-term outcomes? Now, what happens in our, in our society, the way we assess the efficacy of drugs, why they get approved by the FDA is, they knock down the target symptom of a disorder better than placebo over the short term, okay, for six weeks. I was asking a different question. How do they affect lives over the long term? And in many different ways. The symptoms, employment rates, socialization rates. This is a very different question. And one of the things that I think has happened and since the book was published, and one of the reasons, sort of jumping ahead, so I've been on the road and it seems endlessly. <laughs> I've been asked to travel to many countries. I started giving grand rounds at medical schools. And I think the reason is, it's really the first book to look at that question and to look at what science is telling us about how medications shape long-term outcomes. Now, another question I raised was this. If you look at what's driving the disability numbers, it is affective disorders, it's not psychotic disorders. It's people with diagnosis of depression and bipolar illness, and in particular, bipolar illness. Now, if we go back 40 years ago, the prevalence of manic illness, then called manic depressive illness, it was a rare disorder. It's about one in 5,000 adults would have about a manic depressive illness in any one year. Anybody know what the prevalence of bipolar disorder is now among our adult population? One in a hundred. You say one in a hundred, any other guesses? Forty-five. One in twenty. What's that? One in twenty. Well, actually, there are some ways of defining bipolar that say one in twenty. But more generally, you'll hear one in fifty. So, so we went from one in five thousand to one in fifty. So one of the things we want to look at is where are we all the bipolar patients coming from? All right, we really <laughs> need to figure that one out. So what do I write about in the book? I, I, I'm not going to go through the research, but if you look into the chemical imbalance story, it goes like this real quick. That whole story arose from understanding how the drugs act on the brain and not from investigations into people so diagnosed. So for example, let's just say the low serotonin theory of depression, which we've all heard about. Here's how it arises, in a real quick uh, sort of biological lesson. How do neurons communicate in the brain? We have presynaptic neurons that release a neurotransmitter, a chemical messenger, in this case serotonin, into the tiny gap between neurons, which we call the synaptic cleft. And then that messenger, that serotonin, binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call a postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and that's how a message is passed. And then in order to make that message crisp, the serotonin, that chemical messenger, has to be removed from that gap real quickly. And it's removed from that gap in one of two ways. Either an enzyme comes along and metabolizes the serotonin, and the metabolites are cut off as waste, or uh, it is taken, the serotonin is taken back into the presynaptic neuron via reuptake channels. Now listen to SSRI. So let the serotonin reuptake inhibit. The, the drug blocks those channels for serotonin to go back up into the presynaptic neuron. Okay? So therefore serotonin stays longer in the synaptic uh, cleft. It is said to increase serotonergic levels. Okay? Because the drug has that effect, people hypothesized that depression was due to low serotonin. And what they then looked at, to, to try to investigate, once they had this hypothesis, they looked in depressed patients, and they looked to see if those presynaptic neurons put out less serotonin than normal. And they just didn't find it to be so. And then they looked to see, well, maybe the problem is those postsynaptic neurons 
have too few serotonergic receptors, and that's the abnormality in depressed patients. They didn't find it to be so. And you can read, therefore, away from the, you know, we all read the, if we watch TV, we've all seen the commercial, you know, you have like the happy face, there's the, there's the unhappy face, and then you get the serotonin and you have a happy face, and I think then what happens is you walk along the beach with a beautiful woman, and life is good. <laughs> Serotonin is now in balance. But actually, they just never found that uh, low serotonin was the pro problem of depression. And just one small thing you can read in a book called Essential Psychopharmacology by Stephen Stahl. He's a famous molecular psychopharmacologist. He writes in 2000 uh, there is no real serotonergic deficit. Okay? Just didn't find it. Okay, so that was one finding is that, and you could do this for others, did we find that the pathology of mental disorders was due to chemical imbalances? We just didn't find it. Now this does not necessarily mean there's no biology involved, there's not some biology to be found, it just means we didn't find that as the characteristic pathology. And by the way, you can also read a 2005 paper by Kenneth Kemper, co-editor-in-chief of uh, Psychological Medicine, he sums up this long search for chemical imbalances and he says, we have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for mental disorders and we have not found them. Okay? So that's the first thing I looked at. We have a paradigm of care governed by a belief that the drugs are antidotes to chemical imbalances. But I have to say, what science is telling us, and you're going to be surprised by a quote I'm going to read in a little bit, it's a societal delusion. Now, it's really hard to have an uh, artful use of a medication if it's based on a medical delusion. And then you can see the medical delusion says this is like insulin for diabetes, that's why you have to take the drug for life. But that's just not what science is telling us. Okay? So that's, I think, one of the first findings in the book. Now, the second finding then, and this is key to try to understand how the medications may shape long-term outcomes, is once you go on the drug, what happens to your brain? Okay, how does the drug modify your brain? And here's what science shows. So let's say you go on an SSRI. The SSRI blocks the normal reuptake of serotonin from that synaptic cleft, right? It's acting as an accelerator on serotonin activity. Now your brain, being this extraordinary neuroplastic organ with all sorts of feedback sensors, very quickly says, uh-oh. There's too much serotonin in my synaptic class. And I need to compensate for that. And it compensates by putting down the brake on serotonin transmission. The presynaptic neurons put out less serotonin than normal, at least for a period of time. And the postsynaptic neurons, the one receiving the message, actually decrease the density of the receptors for serotonin. Okay, so if you go on an SSRI after a while, you have about 50% fewer receptors for serotonin than normal. Now, you can see, I think, a bit of an irony here. It's, um, prior to going on the medication, there was no known pathology. Okay? We don't know what may be going on. We hypothesized that the problem was low serotonin physiology. Once you go on the drug in essence, that's what you have. You have a low, physiologically speaking, you've sort of been driven into a subserotonergic state. And we're going to see, again, some comments that have come out uh, that since the book was published that refer to this modification. Okay? So, that's the story of chemical imbalances, and it's very different when you dig into the scientific literature. Now, the final question is, or the next question is, how do they uh, uh, affect long-term outcomes in the aggregate? This is a very complicated story in terms of how you uh, fit this together, and I'll tell you it goes like this. In Big picture, how you do it. The first thing as a journalist is you want to figure out what is the evidence base for the use of these medications, right? I want to see, so let's say I'm a psychiatrist at uh, a medical school and I'm giving this talk, I will say we have really solid evidence for the use of these drugs in both short term and long term. And let's just look at the antipsychotics because the evidence base for all psychiatric drugs begins with the antipsychotics. They're at the heart of the psychopharmacological. And the evidence base consists of two parts. One, again, you take people coming into an emergency room. This goes to the 1960s. 
let's say they have psychotic symptoms. One half is randomized to drug in the hospital, the other half is randomized to placebo in the hospital, and then we look six weeks later, which group has a greater abatement of their psychotic symptoms. And with some great regularity, it's those treated with drug that have a greater abatement of their psychotic symptoms. And because of that, the drugs are seen as effective. Okay, they knock down the target symptom better than placebo. Now once that information was in hand, and this goes back to the 60s, and doctors were treating their patients with these drugs, and let's stick with the antipsychotics, they had uh, this question, how long should patients be on these drugs? Right? Makes sense. It's a good thing. And they ran studies designed like this. They would take that cohort of patients that had responded well to the antipsychotics, and it's a subset, roughly about 40% of, at least in the old days, of patients initially treated with antipsychotics would still have their psychotic symptoms abated a year later on the drugs, okay? So that would be still in clinical remission. So we would take that subset of patients who responded well, and in half we would abruptly withdraw the antipsychotic, and in the other half we would maintain them on the drug, and with great regularity, those withdrawn from the medication relapsed at a higher rate. Relapse meaning uh, they had a return of psychotic symptoms. So a doctor said, look, you withdraw the drug and the disease returns. Therefore, staying on the drug reduces the chance that the disease will return. And it's those studies, and they're really all abrupt withdrawal, there's really very few gradual withdrawal studies, that are the basis for long-term use of antipsychotics. And really, it's the same thing for antidepressants, okay? Okay, now my next uh, step as a journalist, trying to put this conventional wisdom under a microscope, is to see, first of all, is there a flaw with the long-term relapse studies? And really, the, the, the relapse studies have two flaws to them. One is just the design of the studies, the abrupt withdrawal, okay? Because we actually know when you withdraw a drug abruptly, it can trigger um, sort of withdrawal symptoms. So we don't really know uh, that relapse rate that people are withdrawn. Is it due to the return of the disorder? Or is it a withdrawal effect? Okay, we don't know. Um, second of all, although we do know this, the few studies that have been done on with gradual withdrawal, the relapse rate is much lower than an abrupt withdrawal. So we know that the sum of this high relapse rate is a withdrawal effect. Even more profound is sort of the Hippocratic oath question. I'll get this into a second. Now imagine a study that goes like this. Half the patients who come into an emergency room are treated initially with antipsychotics. They got psychotic symptoms. And now the other half is treated with psychosocial care but not put on drug. And now we follow both groups for three years, five years, and we look at their, what they're working, symptomatic, socialization. Do we know what the long-term course of, say, unmedicated psychosis is? The relapse studies don't tell us that, right? They don't tell us anything sort of about the natural course and really the natural capacity to recover over time. So those are the flaws that are pretty easily recognized. Now, my next step, and you'll see, I hope you see what we're doing here tonight, is try to go through a logical process. Because what I'm going to present you with is two stories. And really, part of the social responsibility is do we want to cling to the old one, or do we want to cling to this other one? So the next step is this. I, I searched the literature for researchers who tried to address this question. Do antipsychotics improve the long-term outcome of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders? And ask this very question I'm asking in this book. And what you find when you do that is this. The researchers say, we have no such evidence. So 2002, Emmanuel Stitt, he's a famous psychiatrist from the University of Montreal, he says, are neuroleptics, that's another word for antipsychotics, effective in treating schizophrenia after 50 years? And he says, when it comes to long-term evidence, there is no compelling evidence among them. And then he really says something that I would say is the question that all of our society needs to address. He says, one thing is for sure. We run a general, let me see if I get this right. If we wish to base psychiatry on evidence-based medicine, we take a real risk in taking a closer look at what has long been considered true. <laughs> and that is what I do in this book. And what you all are doing if you read the book and try to assess what it might mean to you and to, to social care. We're taking a risk, okay, because we're going to challenge conventional wisdom. All right, now put on your journalist hat. How are you going to...
to try to figure out how antipsychotic anti shape long-term outcomes, just after we've read, researchers say, we just don't have the evidence. But what I did in this book, for all, and I do this for different disorders, I do it for schizophrenia, I do it for depression, I do it for anxiety, I do it for bipolar disorder, and then I also do it for some childhood disorders. Is I tried to put together pieces of a puzzle, a story of science as it unfolds over time, over 50 years. Okay, does that make sense? And, and the, the process goes like this. It begins with trying to understand the Hippocratic Oath. Now, what does the Hippocratic Oath say? First, no harm. Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> it mean? You think it means don't make the patient worse, right? It means something much more subtle and profound. What Hippocrates was saying is there is often a natural capacity in nature to recover from illnesses, whatever they might be. And in order to understand if your medical intervention is not doing harm, you have to have some understanding that you're improving on nature. This is much more subtle. Imagine you have therapy that ends like this. We're going to just do a, specu a speculation, you know, uh, you know hy hypothetical. Let's say you have a certain disease. You give them an intervention. 50% are cured and 50% stay the same. No one gets worse. <clears throat> have you met the Hippocratic Oath? No one got worse. You don't know. Now let's say you find that in the natural spectrum of outcomes is 70% recover and 30% stay the same. Now you actually see your worsening outcomes in the end. Okay? So the point is, we need to start with trying to understand what's the capacity to recover from depression, anxiety, manic depressive illness, psychosis, schizophrenia, what we call schizophrenia. And when you do that, for all the disorders, and we can start with schizophrenia, here is one extraordinary surprise. You find that in, in, when you start to try to flesh out the natural outcomes, an extraordinary capacity to recover. A lot of resilience. You know, and this includes psychosis. You will find that, and there's a thing, there's Samuel Bockel, and then I'll get into the schizophrenia day in just a second. A famous doctor named Samuel Bockel had said this about the natural course of disorders. My experience teaches me that most major de uh, mental disorders, especially the most severe, are largely self-limiting in nature, episodic, unless we do something to turn them chronic. And that's his concern. Okay? How about what was first episode schizophrenia like in 1945 to 1955? Real quickly, you see outcomes like this. You follow a, a, a first episode cohort, in their hospitalized for the first episode, and you look at how they're doing five years later. And it's roughly this. One third of the patients just aren't psychotic anymore. Okay? They had a schizophrenic time. There's another third that in fact you still have some symptoms, but they're able to live independently in the community. So if you look from 1945 to 1955, five years out, about two thirds of the quote first episode schizophrenia patients were living independently in the community five years later. More than 50% were employed. And that's sort of our beginning baseline moment. And the outcomes are for major depression are even more, more sort of episodic. Okay, next thing what you do, real quickly, as you try to put together the story, and let's just follow the antipsychotics. You look at the first long term study, it's done in the 1960s. It has four arms three drug treated group, one placebo group. At the end of six weeks, the drug treated group is doing better. But then comes the curiosity. When they follow up at the end of one year, they know it's the drug-treated patients that are most likely to be re-hospitalized. And at this very early moment in the literature, we see the biggest hint of a paradox. Short-term efficacy, but perhaps long-term pregnancy. The next sort of thing I look at, what did physicians say when the drugs were being introduced? Because they now were used to seeing people treated without the drugs, and now they're going to be seeing people treated with the drugs. Do they notice anything different? What's their clinical perceptions? And it goes like this. Boy, the patients are getting better faster. But, boy, are they coming back to the hospital in droves. And the, you know the phrase, the revolving door syndrome? It's invented at 
this time, really in the 1960s, you first see it, to see this new pattern in their patients. They get discharged, they come back. The other thing you hear is this. It seems that when patients relapse on drugs, their relapses are more severe than when on disease. So this is the other one. Going forward, the next thing I looked at was their retrospective study. A study where someone had five-year data from a hospital, outcomes data, and now he compares it to five-year data in a drug area. Samuel and Lockover did that. He had a group of patients treated with psychosocial care at Boston Psychopathic Hospital in 1947. Similar group of patients in 1967. What does he report? Two things. In 67, the, there's a higher relapse rate, and even much more important, whereas 76% of his patients in the 1947 cohort were living independently, now most are on, on, on disability, etc. So there's much more social dependency. So we looked at the retrospective study, and Sanborn Bakken only says, if we want to think about long-term clinical outcomes, Maybe we need to rethink the long-term use of antipsychotics. Okay, that's the retrospective study. Then, real quickly, there were three studies done in the 1970s, funded by the NIMH, that sought to re-examine this long-term question. And these studies all were basically designed like this: we can have one group treated conventionally with drugs, and over here we're going to have a drug a group treated with psychosocial care. We will delay initial use of antipsychotics. If people don't get better after six weeks, ten weeks, we may use antipsychotics. I will tell you in every instance, the experimental group did better. That was one finding. The second finding was that each time there was a subset of first episode patients that could get better without going on drug and then stay better throughout, say, one, two, three years. And it was that subset that was able to get through their first crisis, so to speak, without going on drug that each time would have the best long term outcomes. Three such studies done in the MIMH. Each time, and this is at the very heart of our research, each time the researchers said this, if we care about long-term outcomes and long-term functional outcomes, we may need to rethink our use of these drugs. Okay. What is that acronym? What's that? The acronym. Who, who did the study? Oh, no, my NIH is the National Institute of Mental Health. Okay. So this is our, our, our top funding agency for mental health. It's part of the National Institutes of and then there's this really profound question that arises by William Carpenter, who is at the NIMH. He says this, we know that once you're on medication, you're less likely to relapse and maintain it. But we raise the possibility that over the long term, the drugs are actually making people more biologically vulnerable to psychosis. So what would be happening if we never put people on drugs to begin with? It's really a fundamental question that arises in 1978. And you can see how it arises, right? It arises from this research. The next thing you have is you have the doctors at uh, McGill University who say, I think we know what's happening. And it goes back to this, what happened to the, the brain. Antipsychotics work by blocking dopamine receptors in the brain. They thwart dopamine transmission, acting as a break. The brain responds by putting down the accelerator. It does some two ways. The presynaptic neurons put out more dopamine. Postsynaptic neurons increase the density of the dopamine receptors. You've got the, you're now super sensitive to dopamine. This is your new brain. Right? Now take away the drug. See the problem? You have that ex your brain's been modified. And he said, this is why we're getting such relapses when you come off the drug. And then they also said this though. Maybe over the long term, we're going to actually have something called tardive psychosis where the psychosis seeps in because of this dopamine supersensitivity and becomes ever more severe. So they raise that flag of worry. Okay? I'm just trying to show the progress of the process here. That worry arises, you can see how it arises, and then this line of investigation is shut off, 1980s. And basically, I hate to say it, the American Psychiatric Association has guild interests, drugs its product, and it just they say, we are not going to investigate this shut off. Okay. And you can see it's confusing, right? You do have short-term efficacy. You have people seeing that when they come off the drugs, they do poorly. And the irony is science is saying, nevertheless, we seem to be shaping outcomes towards greater remissive. It's sort of a paradox, right? It's hard to deal with. Anyway, if you go forward, what do you find from that, just in antipsychotics? Well, one, you find that animal models support the idea that the problem is 
drugs cause an increase in dopamine receptors that makes the brain more sensitive to do uh, dopamine over the time. This makes you more biologically vulnerable to psychosis. That's one thing we have. We have cross-cultural studies, studies done by the World Health Organization that compared outcomes in uh, India, Colombia, and Nigeria, three developing countries, with outcomes in the U.S. and six rich countries. These studies, there was one two-year study, one five-year study, and what the WHO investigators concluded, each time the outcomes were much better in the poor countries, okay? The developed, three developing countries. And the researchers concluded, and listen to this, living in a developed country is, quote, a strong predictor. You won't have a complete remission from schizophrenia. You see there's something wrong with that, right? And then after the first such study, they hypothesized, maybe the problem is that the people, maybe the reason for that is that is that patients in the poor countries are more medication compliant. It's a valid hypothesis, right? That medication compliance is so a key. In other words, if we believe that the drugs are so essential, um, medication compliance should improve outcomes. But they found that, in fact, that medications were used differently in the poor countries. They were used acutely, short term, but only 16% of patients were regularly maintained on the drugs. They had a different paradigm of use. So we have that. By the way, I'm just going to stop here for a second. The whole purpose of this book, it's not a medical advice book, right? It's just taking a big picture look. You know, no one should read this book and make any uh, personal decision about medication use. Uh, should certainly should not make any decision after this talk. It's just looking big picture, okay? And you know, we may find that paradigms of care where uh, some people do better on meds long term, and with maybe selective use models, we're just trying to take a big picture, okay? Uh, the next thing, you look at MRI studies. MRI studies are a little startling uh, around antipsychotics. The MRI studies have shown that there is some brain volume loss over time with antipsychotics. And they have also shown that as that brain volume loss happens, you get some uh, cognitive impairments and functional impairment, and etc. And increased emotional lethargy. That's that. And then finally, we have one longitudinal study, and it's the only such study that I know of in the literature. It was done by Martin Harrell at the University of Illinois. He, in 19, uh, late 70s, 1980s, he began following 200 uh, newly psychotic patients. Okay, he follows them for 15 and actually now 20 years. And of the 200, he keeps 145 in his study, which is really good to follow that many people that long. He ends up with 64 schizophrenic, people diagnosed with schizophrenia, 81 with mild or psychotic disorders. And all he does, everybody treated conventionally in the hospital with drugs, and then discharged, and then they're just free to do whatever they do. Some people will go off, some people will stay on. And the purpose of this study, the reason you all funded it, it's funded by the NIMH, was to see what happens to people who go off their meds long term. Because the understanding, of course, is they do horribly. So what did he find? Let's just look at the schizophrenia group real, 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 real quickly. At the end of two years, 25 to 64 at this time, this would not happen today because not many people get off today, but 25 to 64 were off their antipsychotic medications, and they were doing slightly better than those on meds, okay? And then we see something in this literature we don't see anywhere else in the scientific literature. We see between year two and four and a half a lot of improvement in the off med group, whereas the on med group just sort of stays the same. Such that by the end, it's the only place in the literature you see long-term healing, let's say. It's the only time we capture it. Anyway, at the end of four and a half years, the recovery rate for those on medication, off medication is 40%, those on medication, 5%. So it's an eight-fold higher recovery rate. And it stays that way throughout the 15 years. And there's other data like this. If you look at the... Uh, Spectrum of outcomes among those on medication, it's uh, off medication, 40% recovery, 46% so-so, and 44% uh, so-so, 16% uniform before. For those on medication, it's 5% um, recovery, 46% so-so, 49% uniform before. So what you see is worse outcomes in the aggregate in the medicated group. And in the other psychotic disorders thing, it's the same thing. So they often make group that does better long term. Now, I'm not saying that this proves anything. I'm just saying it's a part of the puzzle we see. 
And by the way, in terms of psychotic symptoms, those on meds, roughly 70% were still having psychotic symptoms at 10 and 15 years. Only 23% or 25% off meds were still having psychotic symptoms. So what you do at least see in this data is a subset of people who got off and did very well. Anyway, what I'm trying to show you here is that do we have science? Does it tell us a story of possibly that really belies the common wisdom. Our common wisdom is that if you have a psychotic disorder, you have to be in drugs for life, right? That's the standard of care. And what you see in this history is a, is a very different story. You see a lot of capacity to recover, at least in subsets of patients. And really what you're seeing is, on the whole, and I'm not saying that some people don't benefit, but on the whole you're seeing worsening outcomes. So, for example, remember that beginning employment rate of about 50%? Remember we talked about that? In the off-med antipsychotic group, more than 50% were employed today. You know what it was in the Medicaid group? About 5%. So, all I'm saying is we have this story of science, really of, in the, in the aggregate, outcomes really being worsened. At least that's what I think the science shows. Anyway, I can tell a similar story for antidepressants anti-anxiety agents, etc. And what I believe science is telling us, time and time again, when we put together this story, is this paradigm of care is in fact increasing the chronicity of these disorders. That's what I believe the science shows. Now let's just go for the two years. I'm not, don't believe that, okay? It's just I'm telling you what the book shows. So now we really have two stories out there, right? We have the story of medical advances, a lot of drugs, academic medicine behind it, conventional wisdom behind it, right? That's our starting point. Now I write a book that says something different. It really challenges this belief system. And it challenges it, I think, in a profound way. If, if you read this book, and if you believe that this science is persuasive, it really becomes a call to change. Because we do want to help people get well long term, that's a value we share. And so it's a call to change. And that's really this fundamental tension that I think the book presents to you all, to society, etc. And now, what Marsha asked me to do is sort of look at what can we learn from the response of what's happened in two years about that essential question, etc. Well, the first. The good? the bad, and the brilliant. <laughs> okay. Okay? You sure can start wherever you want. <laughs> I'm not sure about the brilliant, but anyway. <laughs> well, it's right there. No, it's no. right there. <laughs> um, anyway, the day my book was published, so imagine people behind this, 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 this essential, you know, the accepted wisdom. Do you think they're going to like this book? No. <laughs> they're not going to be happy, okay? And boy, did they strike back. Boy, was there a strike back. The day my book was published in my local newspaper, the Boston Globe, uh, there was a review by a doctor who had never before written a review for the Boston Globe. It was in a department at Children's Medical Hospital that was heavily subsidized by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and here's what the review said. It compared me to an AIDS denier, and it compared me to a South African dictator who, by having denied AIDS caused hundreds of thousands of deaths. Now I have to tell you, when you get up in the morning in your local paper, <laughs> and you're compared to an AIDS denier, this is not the best book launch ever. <laughs> um, I have to say this was really smart, really well done. I, I felt like, I still feel like clapping, so to speak, because it worked. This was my fourth book. My first three books actually got some attention, some sort of awards or recognition as notable books of the year. Everything shut down. All radio interviews canceled. Um, and no other editor newspaper reviewed the book at that point. There was a couple little reviews. There was a review, a little review in Time Magazine that actually was quite good. A review in the New Scientist. Other than that, it was shut out. And sales just didn't happen because there was no notice. Really well done. So what happened then? Uh, because of that in America, I was somewhat known by certain peer groups, that sort of thing, and they began reading the book. 
And then the next thing that happened that sort of became a, uh, a way to look at what maybe was happening with what oh, happened with this. Perspective. Yeah, perspective. perspective. Anyway, what happened was I was invited to become uh, the keynote speaker at the annual alternatives conference. This is <laughs> This is a conference somewhat from Amy's. Amy in the back is laughing at that she knows this story. Uh, the Alternatives Conference is a conference organized by you know, people, peers, that's paid for by SAMHSA. Uh, I was asked to be the keynote, and then I was disinvited to give the keynote. Uh, there have obviously been some complaint, and why are you going to have this person give this talk? And then what happened is uh, the peer community rallied. They began calling the White House, they began calling SAMHSA, etc., and saying, why isn't this person being allowed to speak? Now, I was re-invited. I was re-invited with a caveat. Uh, imagine if you're a keynote speaker and they say, here's the new deal. You will give a keynote speech and then we will have a psychiatrist come up and say what an idiot you are. <laughs> and you won't be allowed to respond. <laughs> That was the deal. <laughs> um, now, normally you would probably say no thanks. But I was so moved, frankly, by people rallying. I said, what the heck? This is fantastic. You know, really to honor the people who had rallied to my side. Now, at this point, the person who's been picked to give the, the rebuttal, so to speak, he goes to a um, let him you know, think behind the scenes. He goes to an academic medical center and he says, tell me where Whitaker's wrong. And prepare the rebuttal. Okay. And I then got leaked what I believe was the response to him. And the rebuttal was this. Unfortunately, he's very accurate. <laughs> and so you, when you saw the rebuttal, it went like this at, at alternatives. One, Whitaker focuses our attention on a car wreck. We really should look at the freeways. And that was number one, not exactly the scientific rebuttal. And the second was this, even I guessed a little bit of this one. Yeah, maybe the drugs make people worse over the long term, but that's true of a lot of drugs. It's not just psychiatric drugs. <laughs> I kid you not. So going forward, what then began to happen? Actually, that actually put the book a bit on, you know, out there. And then things began to happen. I began to hear from some psychiatrists. I began to hear from some psychologists saying, I read your book, I'm upset. What do we do about this? Began putting those pe pe people together on the, um, uh, on the internet during listservs. And they, and by the way, Oregon really was a leader in this. Okay? <laughs> Specifically, it began in Lane County <laughs> with a gentleman named Bruce Abel, and he said, we want to have a symposium to really dis discuss this. And at this point, um, I managed to get a donor to fund the symposium, and, and in order to give the donor some money, we had to form a nonprofit, and that eventually turned into something called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care. We'll talk a little bit more about what they're doing. Now, at this symposium that was held in Portland in February of 2011, <laughs> I don't even know what decade it is. <laughs> um, it was really interesting. There were four workshops a workshop on schizophrenia and antipsychotics, and in presence, a workshop on medication tapering, and a workshop on sort of Medicaid reimbursement. What was really interesting about the workshops was we got academic medical doctors to read the workshops and to go over the data in anatomy and epidemic, in anticipation. And the idea was they would go over the data and decide should protocols be changed, okay? Academic doctors. Now, the, the workshop done by um, antipsychotics was led by two Harvard-affiliated doctors, Chris Gordon and Mark Green. And I will tell you what Mark Green called me up when he read the book, and he says, give me a week and I'll tell you where you're wrong. I know this is not true. A week later, he says, damn it, I haven't found out where you're wrong yet. <laughs> anyway, they led the workshop, and you know, and there was, there was one other interesting thing, and I'm not, I'm, let's just put it this way, there were some doctors sent, psychiatrists sent to that workshop with some academic credentials who were ordered to make sure nothing, um, 
Nothing worthwhile came out of that workshop. They were basically sent there to sabotage the deal. And they were sabotaging the morning. morning. I sat in as a like, fly in the wall. And then some people who had looked at the literature said, well, what about the Herald study? What about this? They hadn't read it. So they read that study, and they came back. These people sent to sabotage it and said, boy, you brought the world. And here what was so profound about this. After two days, that schizophrenic workshop came up with two principles. They said there's an evidence base for avoiding initial use of the neuroleptics, because if you do that, there will be a group of people who will get better without going on the drugs, and that group of patients can have a good long-term outcome. Remember that thought, okay? <laughs> because we're going to see if maybe that possibility is not going to be investigated. And then the second thing they said, even once you use the meds, it's clear that some can do okay off and they should be given a chance to go off. So what they were saying is we need to rethink the use of antipsychotics along the selective use model. And that's what came out of the symposium where people spent weeks and months looking at the literature there and they changed their models. The antidepressant workshop went through a somewhat similar process. Um, they came up with these principles. In terms of over the short term, antidepressants really aren't very effective, more effective than placebo for mild to moderate depression. And you really should try other things like depression, uh, exercise, other sort of psychosocial things before you use antidepressants. And that really you only see real effectiveness over placebo in more severely depressed patients. Then the second thing they initially just, uh, concluded in the workshop was, and you shouldn't use the drugs longer than a year, if at all possible, because there is increasing evidence that the drugs may be depressogenic, increase the chronicity of the disorder over the long term. Now again, that does not mean nobody does, does well on the drugs long term. It just means you're increasing chronicity in the aggregate. Now, when they brought that back to the larger symposium, that sort of stirred a ruckus, and they backed off, and they just said, okay, there's no evidence that the drugs necessarily help long term. Okay. But again, these were symposiums where they looked at this, and they altered conventional beliefs, which you can see was uh, quite, um, for me, it was rewarding, because it sort of was validation, et cetera. By the way, this was the day, this was, the, it was around this, it was this weekend that we think in psychiatry was formed in, in February of 2011. That was a busy weekend for you. That was a busy weekend. <laughs> so, I could go forward with this. What's the next sort of uh, story to tell on this? It's, one is actually, I think, sort of an increasing societal acceptance that something needs to be thought about. Uh, so, for example, uh, the New York uh, Review of Books is a very prestigious uh, publication. Uh, a woman named Marsha Angel, she's the, she's the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. That's a very prestigious journal. She did a two-part front-page review of my book and two other books. Uh, the other one was uh, uh, Daniel Carlos Unhinged and Irving Kirsch's The Emperor's New Drugs. And basically she said, boy, there's something wrong here. And uh, we really need to look at this. And Marsha Angel started getting targeted for if you started going her way. It was nice to have that off that way. Uh, but the point of this was that uh, there was some recognition this was a valid thing for society to be thinking about. At that point, 60 Minutes contacted us all three, uh -huh. um, and then they decided to focus on antidepressants. And they, they, I don't know if you saw that 60 Minutes piece, but they basically followed Irving Kirsch's work showing that antidepressants are really effective over the short term only in very severely depressed patients. By effective, I mean more effective than placebo. So you seem to start to see there some acceptance. You see what I'm saying? Uh, society start changing. And I do want to say about the investigative reporters and the Editors Association Award, just as a sign of increasing recognition that we need to look at this. If you look, if you would Google me, you will see some pretty negative things. You will see he's biased, he's slanted, he's cherry-picked his studies. You'll see other criticisms. You almost cannot see anything that does not have the word controversial before my name now. Seems like it's my middle name. But the Investigative Reporters and Editors Association is an association of 
people at the New York Times, 60 Minutes, Washington Post, etc. And it was set up after Watergate to honor investigative journalism. And the media on this particular story has generally really repeated the common wisdom. So for them to give this book, this award, was really sort of a sense of them saying, maybe we need to look at this. Maybe there's something here. It was sort of a validation. Bob, didn't Marcia's Angels, um, <coughs> didn't she win an award for her? Yeah, she wrote, she wrote a book My called Angel. The Truth About Drug Company some years earlier. Oh, oh right. I thought she won an award for her. Review? So finally, one, one last thing on this, about being on the road 180 days or whatever, I don't know, I've just been on the road pretty constantly. Um, I'm increasingly going to other countries, and society after society is asking the same question. Is this working? I will really tell you, societies are really trying to struggle. Does this paradigm of care, which emphasizes drugs as the cornerstone, is it helping alleviate the burden of distress? And as part of my going around there, I will tell you, every society I go to, they're all seeing soaring disability rates. Denmark, doubled in the last 10 years. Iceland, quadrupled in the last 15, 20 years. UK, same thing. Australia, New Zealand. Wherever you see this, you're seeing soaring disability rates. So you can see why we're talking, you know, why societies are worrying about this. A couple other things. What science has come out, uh, we're going to do two more things. What science has emerged since I wrote this book? Does it invalidate or does it further validate? <laughs> and also, what are people, what are changes that are happening? Um, real quickly, as you saw with the uh, alternative story, nothing was really, really came out to say, here's our evidence showing that medications shape long-term outcomes for the benefit. It's been two years. I've been on panels. I've been in many forums. I've never seen anybody say, here's our studies that show we're improving long-term health. So it's been two years. And I think they would have found it if it were there. The other thing is, and I'm just telling you this, I've been accused of being slanted, bias, cherry-picking, etc. But no one has said, here's the studies he missed. Here's the studies that he miscited. No researcher has contacted me and said, you miscited my data in two years. So I haven't had that sort of attack on the report. And I just think it's important for really myself as a reporter, but if we're going to take seriously this other possibility, you would hope that there hasn't been this attack on the report. Okay, real quickly. How about the chemical imbalance story? Well, it is officially being abandoned. Uh, in 2010, uh, Thomas Insel, he's the director of the NIH, he says this. Really, this was a, a, a bad piece of logic. There's no reason to think that just because the drugs do this, the disease is the opposite. Okay. He wrote this paper. But here's my theme, favorite uh, abandonment of the chemical imbalance story. It's by Ronald Pies. He's an editor at Psychiatric Times, and it was written in 2011. Here's what he says. I am not one who easily loses his temper, but I confess to experiencing markedly increased limbic activity whenever I hear someone proclaim, psychiatrists think all mental disorders are due to a chemical imbalance. In the past 30 years, I don't think I have ever heard a knowledgeable, well-trained psychiatrist make such a preposterous claim, except perhaps to mock it. <laughs> On the other hand, the chemical imbalance trope has been tossed around by opponents of psychiatry who mendaciously attribute the phrase to psychiatrists themselves. You all see what's going on here? <laughs> In truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. <laughs> I have to say, that's the biggest retreat from a story I have ever seen. <laughs> and now people like me are said to have attributed to psychiatrists and they never Anyway, <laughs> but the point is, <laughs> there is full-fledged retreat from that, even though uh, I recently was in a room full of people who had a psychiatric diagnosis, and I asked them, how many of you were ever told you had a chemical imbalance? In this room, let's imagine everyone had a diagnosis. How what percentage of hands went up? 
you might imagine, a lot of hostility. But there has been some real cracking open of psychiatry. And it goes like this. Uh, at some point, main psychiatry, the group as a, the main psychiatric association invited me to come talk to them. We talked, it was tense, and here's what they finished up. Oh, by the way, just one small thing. I, I am flying back from Portland when I came into this. I fly back on a red line. I get to, I get to, I get to Boston, I'm tired, I drive up to Boston, I drive up to Portland, Maine, I swear to God, I get there, and then the psychiatrist rolls up his sleeves and he goes, it's time to take off the gloves. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the beginning of that uh, talk. But here's how it ended. This group put out a, a notice on the list, and they said, this was one of the most important meetings they had, and they urged other psychi psychiatric groups across the country to start dealing with this. So you saw a mind cracking open. Um, since then, I've been asked to give grand rounds at some other uh, you know, medical schools. Um, some of them have gone well, some of them haven't gone so well. Um, but Massachusetts General Hospital, University of Vermont, just out of Berkeley. Um, I have uh, something at, uh, where am I going next week? University of Kentucky. I'm going to University of Alabama. And I could name some others. It's a sign that, grand, you know what Grand Rounds are? Grand Rounds is when they bring in people to talk so theoretically about some cutting edge thing. Uh, it is not normal to bring in a journalist to Grand Rounds. But the fact that this is happening shows that at some level, the profession itself is saying, boy, we really need to that's really what's happening. By the way, I met with the Vermont Psychiatric Association, and they were really on board with maybe we need to rethink this. So I think you're seeing within the profession some, some signs of addressing this and thinking about it. Believe it or not, Finch, I was asked, and again, uh, this was thankful to someone from Oregon. Do you all know David Paul? By any chance, is that name ringing a bell? He's an Oregon psychiatrist, pretty well known. He's got a long history of the APA. He got me invited to speak at the American Psychiatric Association last fall in uh, San Francisco. It was at their second meeting of the year. It's a meeting of like Institute of Community Psychiatry, something like that. And here was the thing. You'll see the tension here. <coughs> so, I was invited to give a talk. Um, <laughs> was invited before Marshall Angels Review came out. <laughs> and after Marshall Angels Review came out, the APA as an organization sort of put out a press release denouncing it. So, yeah, I was invited to speak, but being denounced at the same time. <laughs> uh, they assigned me a room at 8 o'clock Saturday morning. People would not be awake. That was number one. Two, they initially were going to have continuing medical education credits. They withdrew the credits. Three, they normally videotape and uh, you know record the talks and they make it part of a disc. They didn't, they wouldn't do that either. It was sort of no longer an official part of the program. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Uh, there was so much interest, they were asked to move it to a bigger room. The room was that was in maybe held 300 people. Now the association refused to move it, but nevertheless, there was this interest. The place was utterly packed. There were 350 people out in the hall trying to get in. And there was a lot of younger psychiatrists there. And afterwards, they were coming up saying, and it was actually a pretty respectful audience. Questions were good. And a lot of the younger ones, I will tell you, came up afterwards and said to me this. They felt like suing their medical schools for malpractice. <laughs> but the point is really that uh, these were people opening up their minds, right? And, and it really speaks well. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked to speak to the Greta, um, Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry. I don't know if you know that group. It's sort of a think tank for the American Psychiatric Association. If you go there, there are former heads of the APA. It is filled with uh, people who have been higher in the NIMH. It is filled with chairs of the um, psychiatric departments at medical schools. It's a powerful group. Again, it's a think tank. There were many people in that body, <laughs> many people there that were named in the book. Not all in flattering lights. <laughs> um, it was very tense. I'll give you a real quick thing. The first time I met with four different groups, the psychopharmacology committee, sort of two social committees, and then the children meeting, and then I gave a 
memory lecture. The first meeting was with the psychopharmacology committee. You can imagine, tense, really tense. But at the end of the day, we went through this. That committee told me, okay, we're going to start looking at medication tapering protocols. And think about that. Again, I think what you're seeing is the power of science to say maybe we should rethink this paradigm of care. And this is at the very heart of things. Uh, anyway, and I actually, by the way, I spoke to the child psychiatry group. And there was about 30 people. And if there was any moment it was tense, it was that. Because those of you who read the book, uh, really talks a lot about are we helping these children or not. And the child psychiatry group, one of the, at one point I said to them, can you point to research that is showing that we're helping these kids grow up and thrive? And they said they couldn't. They talked about short-term related, but they said we don't have that data. And within that group there was a lot of talk about changing what they were doing and using drugs more short-term, tapering kids off. And what I'm trying to say here is, there is an element out there within psychiatry that is opening its mind to really looking at this science and perhaps rethinking things. Now, it's just one element. I will tell you as I go around and give different talks, often talks are boycotted. Psychiatrists won't show up. And that's, I see that all the time. And sometimes even in this, at, at, the, at the grand rounds at the Oakland Hospital a couple weeks ago, it was basically boycotted. Social workers were there, psychologists were there, so there were very few psychiatrists. So I, I, not, I just want to say it's a big battle. Um, there is an element, I think, trying to engage with this material. How about now finding real initiatives? <clears throat> One, we have the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care that formed uh, at this time at this symposium. Again, it is led by Gina Nickel. She's now the executive director. Do you know that name? She's the former uh, director of community mental health programs in, in Oregon. I think that's it, so it's a mainstream person. Her husband is on the board of Bob Nickel. He used to be uh, the commissioner of mental health in Oregon. So you see that involved. <coughs> um, anyway, there's a board out there. It has a scientific advisory committee. I think they've raised around $3 million now. Um, they're hoping to raise $200 million. I'll we'll talk about Oregon in a second. They're now starting to fund research. Now, that one of the first programs they're going to fund is an early intervention program for first episode psychosis that will be modeled on a very successful form of care done in uh, Western Lapland, in which they delay the initial use of antipsychotics, but throw a lot of psychosocial care at it. Okay? This type of research hasn't been done since the 1970s. This will be the first time they revisit this question. Can we help some people get through their first psychotic break without going on medications and turn it back into an episodic illness? So they funded that. I think they're, getting, they're looking to get IRB approval from Boston University. IRB is the Institutional Review Board that assesses whether this is an ethical thing to do. And I will tell you, they could not get IRB approval unless they became convinced this was an evidence-based thing to do that there was a rationale for that. So this is an example of research that's being funded, uh, of positive change, it's something that it's going to investigate a question that has been investigated for 30 some years. They're also looking at funding um, <clears throat> long-term research into children, etc. Another thing, by the way, the way the foundation is being done, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a community foundation, and they're having all these sub-foundations. So let's say a donor wants to say, I will give 300000 for a first episode project in Georgia. Then they set up a sub-foundation to make that happen. Well, one of the, and then there's different donors coming forth, I want to do this, I want to do that, and setting that. But one of the possibilities that is now being discussed is an Oregon Foundation fund. And I think there's some money maybe coming into it, and that is to fund projects here in Oregon that will look at doing things differently. Now, one place that... Um, there is something on the drawing boards in Southern Oregon, which is where I came from yesterday and the weekend before. There's a psychiatrist down there named Ted Sundin, who um, over the past six months, he formed two book groups. One was a book group of uh, general practitioners, family care physicians, uh, basically family care physicians, and then he had a second book group of psychiatrists. And he forced those poor people to go through anatomy and epidemic chapter by chapter by chapter. Now one thing 
was really interesting that Ted will talk about. The psychiatrist really, this was really difficult. And I mean this in an empathetic way. Imagine you're for a psychiatrist. You've been taught something, you've been doing something, and now you're being asked to confront data that says maybe that wasn't so good. That's really hard. It's really hard to confront that. And I think what, as Ted was saying, it's a real process to try to come through, start there, and end up somewhere else. Now, as Ted says, and Dr. Sunday, he says, you know, I'm, he's been struggling with it for six months. And he says there's sort of two questions. If I believe this, how do I forgive myself? How many patients have I harmed? And how do I go to work tomorrow? It's two really difficult questions. And I think we have to understand that it really is difficult. Nevertheless, he's got the medical community sort of investigating this. And what's happening now as a result? We just, there was just a conference down there. Well, one thing, I was in a locked facility yesterday morning. Uh, 32 beds, I think. 16 forensic patients. And that, that facility is now committed to trying to set up a pro program protocol to figure out who can taper off the meds. <laughs> and how to do it. And how to try to do it safely, etc. And again, they're not looking at tapering everybody off their meds. They just want to see those who want to, to support them in that. And see if they can get down to lower doses, etc. That hasn't been done really ever. We're 50 years old. 50 years of this, and nobody has really tried to see if we support people, what results might we see? And that's what they're talking about doing. Ted, Ted and his group down there are also looking to set up a clinic in which you will come into that clinic, and let's say you have depression or some other problem, and the idea is that they will provide you with holistic care, a menu of, of care. And that care will be like this. They'll try to set you up with exercise part of an exercise group. They will try to help you with nutrition. They will work on, if you want to meditate, they will work on meditation, spirituality. Um, as Ted says, I don't know anything that's better than helping people go back to work if they're not working. Stable housing. All these sort of psychosocial care, and then they'll think about how to use the medications in some sort of selective, limited, cautious manner. They're not throwing medications out the door, and I don't think they should. The question is, really, for whom and for how long? And that's a very different question than one size fits all. And if you see Ted, maybe you can get him up here. He's got this new sort of uh, protocol. It's really beautiful, I have to say. Because the whole conception begins differently. The whole conception is, people come in, they have psychiatric distress, they're human beings, there's a context for distress, right? Sometimes there's a lot going wrong with their lives. And we're going to sort of say, how can we help rebuild social bridges, integration, help them sort of become empowered to sort of learn about their mind, control their mind better, take responsibility, be healthier physically. It's really a very different vision. And he wants to set up a clinic that will provide that, he wants to make it into a research study. Again, that will be an example of really rethinking a paradigm of care. By the way, I have a website, madpanerva.com, and one of the things we're doing on that website is that we're just putting up new research studies that appear, and there is a lot of research coming out about the benefits of hiking, the benefits of walking, the benefits of yoga, in a research way, the benefits of nutrition. There is a lot of data coming out about the benefits of psychosocial care, so it's becoming more evidence-based. The third thing, just to tell you an example of what's going on, uh, Ted Sunday has a big group of patients. Uh, basically, it's a bipolar group. And as a group, and I sat in with them yesterday, and there are many people who would like to taper down off their medications. And so he's basically going to, as collectively, as a group, sort of explore this option. Tapering down, trying to do it with support. What else do you need? And 
really being sensitive to each other. If people need the medications, fantastic. And if some people can come off, great. But it's really like a group effort to rethink long-term use of the medications, and that's consistent with some of the data that I spoke about. Um, there's some other projects going on in Vermont, um, where I was asked to speak, and the Commission of Mental Health came there. Their state mental hospital was flooded in um, the fall of this year by a hurricane. They've now set aside a pot of $60 million. They're not going to rebuild, they're not going to build a new hospital there. And what, one of the things they're looking at doing is perhaps starting Centuria houses. These are some <laughs> For those that you don't know, Centuria, that was one of the projects done in the 1970s that looked to see if you could uh, provide a safe environment for newly psychotic patients and people to be with people. Could you help people, some people get through their psychotic break without going on meds? The answer was yes. Vermont is looking at that, and now they want to fund such projects. So what I'm saying is you're seeing, I think, these little seeds grow. And they're just tiny little seeds, okay? They really are tiny seeds. It's a big country. I don't know a lot more seeds. Well, I will say one thing. There's a, there's a group, there's an association of residential uh, therapeutic communities where people go and stay long, longer periods of time. I spoke to that group. At least two are now sort of trying to provide care for those who want to try to taper off. They will support you on that in sort of farm-like environments and see if it can be done successfully. Where? What's that? Where? Uh, one is in North Carolina, but I think one's going to be opening up in St. Louis. And I think there's one in Western Massachusetts that's going to begin to do this, and one in Vermont. Again, just small seeds. And I think the possibility is this. Again, we've been living with a really pretty pessimistic vision. And the pessimistic vision we've been living with is you have a broken brain, right? If you have a psychotic episode, if you have a manic episode, if you have depression, you're said to have a chemical imbalance, you need to be on drugs for life, it's a chronic disorder. That's the pessimistic story we've been living with. And drugs are the cornerstone of that. The vision I think that people are struggling towards, whether we get there or not, I'm not sure. It's a much more nuanced vision. It's a much more optimistic vision. It's a vision that says it's quite human to have psychiatric distress. God knows why it happens. <laughs> a lot of different reasons, okay? It's really, it's almost a Shakespearean vision. And that is, if you're human, you have a capacity to have a lot of psychiatric distress. And those of us who are English majors know that that's what Shakespeare is telling us. <laughs> including psychosis, mania, depression, etc. But the great thing about that vision is that that's your vision, that's your philosophical vision of human beings. It's like this. You can, you can have a time, and if you have, oops, if you have the wrong, if you have certain stresses, you can end up in a place where you need help. Okay? You can have a lot of psychiatric distress, whatever the symptoms may be. But with this vision, the idea is, with the right psychosocial care, you don't remain here. You don't have a broken brain, but you can come back over here and basically have an episode of psychiatric distress. That's really the vision. And we're going to try, and the vision is, you can have so many people coming back where it was just episodic. It wasn't a chronic thing. That's the vision. And I think you see it's a, non, it's a much less stigmatizing vision. It's an inclusive vision. It's a vision of about human beings. You know, God, you know, we are just emotional creatures. And we go ups and downs. We have our mood fluctuations, etc. But it's a much more tolerant vision. It's an expanded vision of what it means to be human. It's also a vision that talks about resilience. It talks about human beings having this extraordinary capacity to go to difficult moments and with the right care get better. So it is an optimistic vision. It's also, I think, a vision of a collective responsibility. So right now we say when someone has psychiatric distress, it's your fault. You're the problem. You have the broken brain. We're going to fix you. The new vision is more like this. We as a society have to create better social wealth. social web. And a social web is a lot of things. It's, 
its housing, its nutrition, its, and it's things like meaning in life, it's, it's things about like how you know, promoting friendships, all those things we all need to stay well, both to get well and stay well. You know, I think that's the promise, the hope. And by the way, in this vision of things, it's not that people are saying that the medications may not have a place. Plenty of people are saying, maybe you have it as a tool to help you get through that distressful period. And maybe there are some people who will do better long term, even with that tool long term. But it is also a vision of medications where you say, maybe some people will do better without going on the meds, so you don't have this change in the brain. And many, many people, in fact, will not need the medications long term. Just are fine. So I think those are the... Those are the, that's the tension we have here. We have this old belief, produces a lot of profits, there's a lot of prestige invested in this, academic psychiatry, etc. And the question is, whether I think, I believe there's science supporting this other vision. I believe there's a lot of people who would like to embrace this other vision. And the question is, what are we going to have as a society in the future? I don't know. But I think rethinking psychiatry is trying to do is at least raise the issue, raise awareness, and have people decide, should we try to go for this other vision? So that's, that's the whole well, thing. Well, I want to So, uh, questions, comments, that's good. I just want to, uh, we have 15 minutes, so please keep your questions succinct, and um, this is great, and quite a celebration. Um, I have a question. Um, I read a book called uh, Future Shock by Alvin Hoff. It was published in 1970. He defined future shock as the human response to overstimulation. Okay. Remember the Lucille Ball comedy routine where she's sitting on a stool and she's picking, there's a conveyor belt going by and she's picking out the bad fruit, you know, throwing it. And then she's working calmly along and all of a sudden they speed up the conveyor belt, okay? And as a result of speeding up the conveyor belt, she gets frustrated, she has anxiety, and then she starts acting out. It's a comedy, it was funny, we all laughed about it. But I think what we're seeing, and I think the reason why so many people are, have the need for the drugs, is that we're living in a culture that, who, that our society that is speeding up so rapidly that our, that our body physiology can't keep up with our technology. And we see it every day, you know, and I think that's the concern that I have when half your tax dollars go to support the military industrial complex. You know, it's like, you know, we gotta look at what's causing people to want the drug. And I think that's one of the biggest problems I'm seeing today is this human response to overstimulation. We're moving at an enormous velocity just with cell phones and, and computers. Right. Just, he's raising the question, do we have a healthy society? No. <laughs> I personally would agree with you. We don't have a very healthy society. But that's part of the question. So if we don't have a healthy society, are drugs the answer or do we maybe need to create a healthier society? And I think maybe the answer is we need to create a healthier society. So it's in one, um, I would like just because it's being filmed and I'll be showing this. Uh, Can you speak up? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, could you, is this, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could, could you very uh, quickly sh share the study about children and how the NIMH heralded the 13 month marker and what happened at the end of that? And then also very quickly, um, share how children of color and foster children are targeted because I'm going to be using this. So. Yeah. She's asking two questions. She's asking actually about a long term study of stimulant medications uh, funded by the NIMH. It's called the MTA Multimodal Study, something like that. It was done in the 1990s when it was launched. The NIMH said this. This is the first well designed study of stimulants designed to see, do these medications help children long term? Okay, that was the purpose of it. And one of the reasons for it was, this was in the early 1990s, they said, we have no evidence that the drugs help long term. 
So at the end of 13, and basically it compared stimulants to behavioral care, odd design. After 13 months, there was a big announcement that medicated patients are doing better. A bigger reduction on their ADHD symptoms, that's whatever, hyperactivity, and slightly better on reading. And that was really promoted, big time. We now have long-term evidence that stimulants help. Then they continued following the kids, and at the end of three years, they found that being on medication was a marker not of benefit, I'm quoting, but of deterioration by the end of three years. At the end of six years, those on drugs, in fact, those who had stayed on the stimulants had worse ADHD symptoms, higher delinquency rates, some functional impairment, etc. In other words, and as the lead investigator said when he was in the UK, he will not say this in the US. We had expected that medicated children would do better uh, over the long term, but that is not the case. We found no benefit on any domain of functioning, and that should be made very clear to the patients. Those three year and six year results are never told to patients. They're not publicized, they're not on the NIMH websites, highlighted. The APA does not incorporate them into their treatment guidelines, and this is part of the problem that Cindy's talking about. 13 month results are heralded. Three year and six year results are not. And if you're a parent of someone diagnosed with ADHD, what do you want to know? And you want to know is this could help my kid grow up and thrive. And that information is not being told. That's one answer to Cindy. The second answer to Cindy is this. She was asking, what about African American uh, children and children in foster care? They're getting hammered. Foster care children in particular are just getting hammered with antipsychotics. I just read a chapter in a book on this. Something like 60% of children in foster care by the time they're teenagers are on antipsychotic medications. And if you look as to why that is, it's just behavioral purposes. It's not that they're quote psychotic, it just knocks down the aggression, makes them sleep longer, that sort of thing. It is a horrible. You know, what, who are foster children? Foster care children are children who sort of drew a short straw in the lottery of life. They get born into a family that's sort of dysfunctional, right? Difficult. And what are we doing as a society? We're blaming the kid. We're now saying, you've got bipolar or whatever it is, and we're medicating you and giving you antipsychotics. We are. We're the guardians of those kids, right? And that's what we say. So we're medicating. I will tell you, I have talked to many foster care kids. They are not happy, those who are doing well at age 18 and having spent their youth on antipsychotics, and that's those who are getting on. So if there's any moral question, I'd say this is a really big, important one. You are starting to address it here in, in Oregon. There's some efforts I know to knock down the use of uh, psychotropic medications in kids. In fact, I heard about this in the main calendar today. Yeah, next question. Um, the, I can't remember what the statistic, what you said. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm, my name is Kevin Fitz. I'm an executive director of the Oregon Mental Health Consumers Organization. One of our long-term goals is to, to put together a care farm for people in acute psychiatric crisis and uh, uh, take away uh, the coercion and non-violence and the forced medication and try to work experimentally and stuff like that. So I, I find this stuff really intriguing. Um, my question is, looking, and I don't know what the statistic you said, $40 billion a year. What, so we're, I don't know what, what generation we're at, first, second, or third generation psychiatric. I, I can't imagine that commerce selling an Abilify pill at 10 bucks a pop is going to go away quietly. And so, what, so I wonder, what is science looking at um, as far as next generation medications and looking at, well, maybe these things cause brain damage or neurotoxicity or whatever, and maybe with computer models, maybe we can do better, it, it, any sort of thing like that. And what is your next book going to be? <laughs> um, so the first question is, is the, is the pharmaceutical industry going to give up a $40 billion uh, industry? No, probably not. <laughs> By the way, you want to hear something amazing? In 2010, I think it was, antipsychotics were the leading revenue producing class of drugs in America. <laughs> Antipsychotics, more than statins, more than any other class of drugs. They generated more revenues than any other class of drugs. And I have to say, we are one psychotic population, I guess. <laughs> TV advertising. Here's the answer in terms of future drug development. 
Drug companies are getting out of the business. And here's what I mean. About six major companies have shut down their psychopharmacology research efforts. Why is that? Because after all of these years of uh, investigations into the biology of mental disorders, that they don't have a clue. I'm serious. Well, the way drug development works, they try to find molecular targets, right? Promising molecular targets. They don't know what to target, other than to just keep targeting what the previous drugs targeted, which would be more Me Too drugs. And basically they're saying, until the science improves, it's just so hard to get a drug that is any better than the old ones. And um, how are we going to sell our story then? Especially when the population has become so skeptical. This has become so pronounced that Thomas Insel did a paper saying that maybe um, the government has to start developing drugs. So Thomas Insel is saying, Thomas Insel's paper is really interesting. It goes like this. Chemical balance story is not true. Okay? Then we got off the base on that. Two of these drugs, he says something like, far too, far too people even respond to the drugs and really far too people recover from the drugs. They're really not very effective. And he says there's no evidence that we're reducing the morbidity or mortality from with these drugs. So in other words, 50 years into this, outcomes aren't good. But he says the promised land is near. <laughs> the promised land is always near. Like, you know, the new genetics, etc. The, the truth of the matter is there's a real crisis in the field right now <coughs> because of this lack of biological <coughs> understanding and new targets. As far as my next book, if I ever stop traveling, um, I want to do a book on what is science telling us about how to uh, create healthy children, healthy minds, and that sort of thing. Sort of from the womb to age 18. We're not doing, and how do you organize a society to do that? So we're not doing a very good job of that. So. Kind of like Joseph Jill's Pierce research. Exactly. <laughs> so that's my hope if I can ever sort of get to that. Um, if a child grows up on medication as their brain is growing and developing, if they get on the meds as an adult, how likely do you think their brain can make a full recovery, or do you think that they'll be permanent damage? Y'all hear that question? Uh, this is really a profound question, thank you. She says this, if you medicate a child, and for years she should have said right? when the child then gets off the medication as an adult, does the brain sort of heal, or does it return to normal, so to speak? That is a great question. Part of me says, yes. One of the great things about the brain is its extraordinary neuroplasticity. And um, so you will see, for example, this is a sign of the brain to heal. Um, kids going on antipsychotics actually have a real high rate of tardive dyskinesia. Do you all know what tardive dyskinesia is? You'll see motor tics. You might see the, the lip going, the mouth, the tongue going around like this. Anyway, you'll see motor tics, etc. And tardive dyskinesia is a sign that the basal ganglia is becoming dysfunctional. So the basal ganglia is the area of the brain that controls motor movement. Now, in adults, once it happens, even if you withdraw the offending on an antipsychotic, often it remains the tardive dyskinesia, which is a sign that the basal, the basal ganglia dysfunction is permanent. Now, with antipsychotics in children, the risk of TB is actually higher. Okay? But the good news is, if you withdraw it, you see a lot of resolution of the TB, which is a sign that the brain is healing itself. That's the good news, okay? Here's some recent really upsetting news, uh, which I was just researching. If you look at kids going on SSRIs uh, as they enter puberty, then they go to college. Now, one of the things one of that's real well known with SSRIs is some sexual dysfunction. Okay? It's a real well known side effect. 60, 70 percent. There's a diminishment of arousal. There's some diminishment of, if you can, orgasm, sort of orgasmic pleasure, that sort of thing. There's a diminishment of bonding, etc. So, as you might imagine, a lot of kids that are on SSRIs, they go to college, and what do they say? My friends are having sex. They seem to be enjoying it. I would like to have sex. So uh, what a lot of them do is they, they want to come off their SSRIs. Here's what's happening. About 25% of those who've been on their SSRIs during puberty can't get back their sexual function. And 
This is being named called PSSD. It's called post-sexual SSRI dysfunction. Post-SSRI sexual dysfunction is what it's called. The thought is this, and I don't want to alarm you, but here's the thought. You go on an SSRI. The SSRI acts as a stressor, ups, and it causes your brain to go into a subserotonergic state. All right? It, 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 you end up with fewer serotonergic receptors. Now you come off the drug. The thought has always been is that the serotonergic receptors will renormalize, they'll repopulate. But there's actually no stressor causing that to happen. And what has happened is, in the presence of the drug, the brain has reset. And this is a whole sort of uh, line of research known as epigenetics. So your gene expression has changed, the sort of homeostatic equilibrium of the cell has changed. And in the absence of a stressor, maybe the brain can't get back its normal serotonergic function. Now there's been eight rat studies on this, where they give SSRIs to rats when they hit puberty, which in rats is at uh, day 45, I believe, they do it at relevant doses. Every study has found that as adult rats, they are, quote, impaired in their copulatory behaviors. And if you look at those rat studies, they say maybe the reason is because of this serotonergy problem, You're driving it into a subsensitive state. I know this is really upsetting for anyone to hear. The, some of this research is being done at the University of Iowa. And the researcher who's talking about this you know, think about the loss. Because it, the, the kids, and by the way, there's chat, there's chat boards out there like crazy kids talking about this. They, they're, they're sharing stories and all. And some countries have now officially recognized it as a side effect. And by the way, it's not just kids, you'll see adults that have been on the drugs long term come off, they have the same thing too. It seems to be particularly problematic if it happens during puberty for whatever reason. The, Sexual dysfunction in some ways is remarkable. I interviewed many, many people who have this, and they said it's not just the sexual dysfunction. They'll say, I just can't get excited about life. I just really can't feel emotional towards somebody. One person says, I see a beautiful girl, I know I'm supposed to be attracted, I just can't feel it. Um, if this is so, you can see why medicating children is such a profound thing. So if we modify the brain, cause changes, How, what are we doing to kids long term? And it's just such a profound thing to be doing. And the worry now is the brain resets in response to the drug, and in some, not always, but in some cases it just can't reset. I, I feel really almost bad about saying this, but I think you can see that if you believe this is what science is saying, showing, well, you really have to think about putting kids on meds. You really have to think about it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> so, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I just want to say, uh, I've been seeing a lot of positive things. I've been living out of Dignity Village for a year, a couple of months. I've seen come, people come in here not talking, not having social encounters, and I see that grow. Because all of a sudden they are not being judged for being homeless, they're not being diagnosed by anybody, and they're not being um, studied or they're just being let be. And they're also invited to participate in community. So they come together to decide issues and govern themselves. And it's a really powerful experiment going on. Um, so I've been seeing the cover happen, just being let alone and just being respected as another human being. And this is with all the internalized oppression that people who have been on the house for a long time have and carry. And carry from being poor and have that internalized oppression. Even with that, there's been a lot of recovery. And I really love the last part of your book about open dialogue. And I said, this is where we need to repair society is by having conversations with each other. Like, you know, right now I'm really aware, you know, that I'm a white person living in Dignity Village and that people of color are targeted by police and they're not crazy, they're criminals. And they're locked away in, in an absorbent amounts of time. Of, you know, and it's like another associated connection thing. 
And the big, big problem is that we think that we are separated from each other. That is the underlying problem, is we think that we are not united. We are all come from the same dirt, the same water, the same air. Every one of us. And when any of us are suffering, you know, we have uh, empathy neurons that respond to seeing that. So it's happened to us when we see somebody else suffering. And, and it's like, I am also a psychiatric survivor. And it's taken a long, long time to see how much people who are psychiatrists and people who have that um, trying to help someone else, and how much they're going to suffer. And I feel for that. Because I know they have to suffer going through psychiatry rounds to hurt people, know that they're hurting people, but couldn't say they're hurting people. Because that, that is a whole aspect of cult mind control. That's an a aspect of cult mind control. To have people saying something, but you're seeing something else. It's really hard to separate yourself and actually say the truth for yourself and stand up for that truth in those situations. Yeah. Done, done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. slippery slope in the field of psychiatry toward use of the field in class warfare. And if so, how important would it be to recognize a holistic society change against such utilization? In some ways, your question is not far off what he's talking about. Uh, what, what he, if you heard that question, is, is, is are there class really? Or is this, is, is, when we talk about diagnoses and we talk about who gets, quote, treated, who gets committed, is there a class element? Is there a racial element involved in this? And the answer is yes. And uh, there's a lot of research related to this. I mean, first of all, if when you were talking about the homeless, uh, you know, often people at a lower class are most more likely to be diagnosed with whatever. Um, there's famous racial studies on who gets diagnosed with schizophrenia, and the most famous one goes like this. They had this, they, they, they sent out a, a, a chart. The symptoms are the same on every chart. There's only one thing that's changed. Is it a black male, black female, white male, white female? And then they ask psychiatrists to make a diagnosis. But remember, the symptoms are exactly the same. Now, which group do you think was most likely to be diagnosed schizophrenic? Black male. Black male. What's the next? What's that? Black female. What's the next? White female. Yeah, so it's white female. At least it was white male. Now, why is that? <laughs> well, basically, the point was. Yeah, the point was this. Further away people are from the person doing the diagnosis in class and gender, the more severe the diagnosis in essence, the more likely they're to be recognized as odd, doing something different, that sort of thing. So the point of this is a lot of these are social constructs, right? I mean diagnoses. And it is where you have a sense that some people are not behaving correctly, right? Or they're not behaving to certain norms. And then you have to ask who, whose norms? And then even let's you just for a second go into what the class we're talking about. How about the old ADHD thing? What is ADHD? It's really a diagnosis that says this kid doesn't do well in the school environment, right? So um, one of the things we're saying is the kid isn't fitting the environment that we're creating for that kid. But we blame the kid. We're not saying that maybe that environment stinks, right? And let's say for whoever it might be, certain class, etc. So also, this is sort of a long-winded, not very good answer, but what I'm trying to say is psychiatric, psychiatric diagnoses do have a social element. They do have a class element in terms of who's diagnosed, that sort of thing. And I think we have to recognize that. And one of the things that's happening in prison, I used to work in prison a long time ago, in Attica prison. And Attica used to be, well, at the time I was there, they just had the riots. It was one of the roughest prisons in the country. But at that time, they were not diagnosing prisoners as prisoners as mentally ill. They were criminals, okay? But the great thing about just being a criminal and not mentally
mentally ill was you got probation and you were dying. <laughs> now what we're doing is those people get in prisons, they get a mental label on them too. Okay, they always hear, we got so mentally, so many mentally ill in jail. Well, <laughs> what we're doing is sort of doubly pathologizing them, right? So you, they, they, they have kids grow up, they're in a certain social environments, maybe they commit a crime, and next thing you know, now they're said to be bipolar and a criminal. And then they're medicated. Well, that's sort of like a double whammy. All I'm saying is, if we're going to reform this whole thing, we do have to be aware of class elements, race, and racial elements, etc. They certainly play a role. And you see that in the foster care kids as well. Okay, thanks. Would you have time to uh, read over a table of advantages and disadvantages towards a holistic class challenge? After, sure, after the, after the, after the, the talk show. Sure. Okay, okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Um, I am a parent of a, of a child who has spent most of her young adult life in and out of hospitals and um, currently is in a group home and uh, in order to stay in the group home, she has, she's on SSI. She has to take the medication. And I began wondering, even before I I was a believer in the, uh, the current paradigm of there must be a chemical imbalance and some kind of cocktail, she's been through many different cocktails of medication, somehow something will help her advance out of this group home. But I noticed over the past year, I keep asking, why is there no progress? Why is she not advancing? Why does she have not have encouraged to get a job or she doesn't have, there's no advancement. She just seems like they're aware, it's a, she's not in a hospital, but she's being warehoused. All of her money is going to this organization. What can she do if she wants to break out? She's kind of stuck because in order to stay in that home, which is her shelter, she has to take the medication. If she doesn't want to take the medication, but she's homeless. Right. Y'all heard this question? Her daughter's in a group home. In order to stay in the group home, she has to take her medications. The option basically is homelessness, right? And her daughter's not progressing. Sort of just stabilizing. And, and you said your daughter's on a cocktail, correct? She's on more than one drug. Um, this is why this question is important about what, what we believe. Because if we believe that we've made great progress, the drug should be the cornerstone of the care, next thing you know we set up programs where the goal really is just to stabilize people so often, right? We're not, because we don't really believe in sort of robust recovery. We insist on taking medications because it's the cornerstone of care. By the way, as you know, in many instances you will see people on cocktails just by their definition, sort of a sign things aren't going so well, right? If they were going so well, we wouldn't need cocktails, we wouldn't need this whole thing. How old's your daughter, man? 30. 30. And she also has long term health damage. Right. Uh, she did not have uh, diabetes. She has diabetes. She did not have high, you know, there's a lot. Right. Of right. All I can say is in some ways, this is, this is the failure of the system we have right now. It really does not help people get robust lives back so often. And we need a system that at least does a better job of offering the people that possibility. And um, offers the possibility for those who might want to, want to go off meds at some point to give them support in doing so. And still not lose your shelter. And be supported in that. That's why I think this whole question is so important. Is so, Right now, there's just this box, and there's no other possibility. We need to create other possibilities. So, the irony, the answer to your question, what can she do? I don't know. I feel she's a guinea pig for the system. This is happening to a lot of people. Now, on SSI, group homes, cocktails, that is a really common thing happening now, and in poor health. And one last thing, and I don't mean to scare you, do you know what age people are dying? that are having this paradigm of care on cocktails? Well, it was 25 years early, but that's people who were
of women, particularly women with trauma histories and personality disorders, which is a whole other issue. Um, and um, I'm actually doing a lot of research on trauma-informed care, which basically asks, instead of asking what's wrong with you, asks what's happened to you, which yeah. I think is a really good um, potential model for working with people, particularly women and women who self-harm. Um, so I was wondering if you had any insight into that or have seen, um, there's something called the sanctuary model. What was um, the last part, I was just wondering if you've seen any models in practice. I know there's one called the Sanctuary Model. Um, people at uh, Samuel Hospital actually did some really pioneering things around that. And so I just wanted to bring that up. Sure. Well, two things real quick. She's talking about uh, the role of trauma in the developing of certain symptoms. Uh, sexual trauma, I will tell you, if you look at women diagnosed with schizophrenia, you will often find sexual trauma in the past. It is real common. Uh, that's number one. Do you see some diagnostics that are gender related? Absolutely. Uh, the old joke about borderline personality disorder was that was a diagnosis given by a male psychiatrist to a woman he didn't like. <laughs> it used to be sort of a woman's diagnosis. I think they're changing that, but that sort of thing. Uh, I think this is part of the future, is, is to understand that the role of trauma. A lot of research showing that trauma does correlate with later onset of psychotic symptoms. And what you said, I think, is really beautiful. Instead of asking what's wrong, let's ask what happened. And that's a wholly different thing as well. And that applies to everybody, kids, etc. Uh, so that's really, that's really a great way, great way to put it. And by the way, one last thing on this gender thing. You also see a lot of, uh, uh, frankly, of diagnosing related to, uh, you know, youth growing up, say, home, you know, gay, lesbian youth, transgender youth. You see a lot of diagnosis related to that sort of identity being difficult. One, one thing, the Oregon legislature, it, it came up um, in the last legislative session, not counting our most recent special session. Um, there is a bill presented in the state legislature that would expand the right to prescribe medication beyond just the current um, legally nurse practitioners, general uh, doctors, and board certified psychiatrists can prescribe legally in Oregon. But the psychologists got together and decided that they needed to be able to subscribe, prescribe, excuse me, medication. So my question, I, I don't know the outcome of that legislation, but it got me thinking, if this is like a trend, I don't know if it is, I don't know if other states are, are going to broadly expand the rights of other treatment providers to prescribe medication. If it is a trend that picks up steam, my question to you is, would this likely expand the abuse of medication or over medication, or would it possibly um, have the opposite effect where prescription, prescriptions could be given more judiciously because people who are not just trained in the medical model but from other educational backgrounds also have the power to prescribe. You know the question? The question is, others get prescribing powers beyond psychiatrists where this leads to more use of the drugs or more judicious use of the drugs? I don't know. But I think it actually might be the latter, but not for the reason you necessarily you say. Right now what happens is you have an entire branch of medicine that has a guild interest in promoting medications. And I'm talking about psychiatry historically, because for the longest time they were the only ones with prescribing powers. And that's worth a lot. Now as that prescribing power becomes diluted, diluted, uh, guild interest in promoting that model of care may lessen. They may actually have a new role as skeptics of the drugs, as the ones who know how to use them most judiciously and cautiously. So I think that might change uh, the storytelling we hear around the drugs from psychiatrists. I actually think expanding the powers is good. I know that's an unconventional answer. This is the last question. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for who you are and your work. And what inspired you to review this research and write the book? So, the question is what inspired me to uh, uh, write this book? 
tempted to say masochism. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I came at this totally through a back door. Um, by the way, I started as a conventional reader with conventional wisdom. It really goes back to when I was doing a series for the Boston Globe and um, really abuses of patients in psychiatric research centers. And I came upon the World Health Organization studies that said uh, that thing about it's just living in a developed country is a strong predictor you won't do well. And I said, why is that? It just seems something wrong in our favor. And then when I looked at the study, um, and found that the medication protocol was different. I was stunned. You know what that series also wrote about? How unethical it was to ever do studies where you take, took people off their antipsychotics. We said that's unethical because these drugs are like insulin for diabetes. You should never take them, and you should never do a study where you're taking someone's schizophrenia for minutes. So it really was two things. One, that the failure. True that suddenly I, it didn't make sense with what I knew to be true. I learned this, that essence of the importance of um, the drugs. And the third was this. I remember calling him uh, someone from Oregon, David Oaks, from Mind Free. And I'm calling up about the medication and all studies. And I'm basically searching for a quote from David Oaks saying, yeah, that's horrible that they went through the drugs. They wouldn't do that to any other class of patients. Instead, David Oaks says, oh, there's good reason to do that. And David basically said, listen, maybe there's a whole other story to be discovered out there. And it's the perspective of those who are treated may be very different than the perspective of those who are doing the treatment. And I became very interested in that story. And that led to Madden America. And one of the things about Madden America is it incorporates the understood, sort of the words and the vision and the perspective of those who are treated into the history. And when you do that, it's a very different history. So that's how I did Mad in America. I really, as Marcia said once, after I did Mad in America, my agent said, run as fast as you can from this topic. Don't get into it again. It's not good for your career. <laughs> so I'm serious. And I wrote two other books, but then people kept saying, what about kids? What about bipolar? What about depression? And I just think it's such an important subject for our society. It is changing us. It is changing how we um, raise our children. It's changing about our sense of self, about what's the resilience. It is, I think, actually encouraging a sense of victimization or sort of powerless before our brain chemistry. So it is so such an important thing in our society. So I really wanted to come back to it because um, is it working for us? And if not, what might we do better? It just seemed like a profound topic. Thanks for having